Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Respectful Workplace webinar. My name is Florence Dumray, and you know, I just want to—I just joined ECI in August, and I'm the director of marketing communications here at ECI. And with me is Casey Williams, our amazing events manager, who runs all of ECI's working groups and who has set this entire webinar up for us. So before we get into the details of this webinar, I just really want to welcome um, all of you on the call. There's about 360 folks um, here. And for those who, of you who are not familiar with ECI, the Ethics and Compliance Initiative is a best practice community of organizations that are committed to creating and sustaining high quality ethics and compliance programs. Since 1922, we provide research and a best practice community, as well as certification opportunities for ethic, ethics and compliance professionals. If you're interested in learning more about our work and joining ECI, please reach out to Tia Berry, Tia at ethics.org, and she's a manager of our client success team. This one-hour presentation is one of ECI's past working groups, Building Respectful Workplace. Led by the co-chairs of this group, they will be talking with you about the development of the report and their focus of outlining the areas of concern and the steps companies can take to prevent the deterioration of civility and respect in the workplace. Just to give you a background of the working groups, ECI's working groups are an effort to encourage networking and collaboration among its members, offer multiple working group opportunities based on particular issues driven by member interests. The purpose of these 20 to 25 member groups is to help ECI members learn from one another via dialogue and through the sharing of resources and the benefits of which strengthen the larger ECI community. Working groups are driven by a shared goal to produce a practical, action-oriented deliverable for the benefit of ECI's members. Casey will be driving our Zoom platform today and will be the person who will be managing the chat function. Any questions you may have, please put it in the chat box. As a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and will be available to view on our website one week from today. This webinar is worth one CEU credit. If you're needing a credit, please indicate that in the post-evaluation and we'll send you a certificate in the next week. Our agenda today will be the introduction of the speakers, presentation, open discussion, and concluding remarks. Joining us today are the co-chairs, Mike Kraft from Fannie Mae and Lori Costello-Martinez from Salesforce. So, Flora, so thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you to Casey for all her assistance in um, helping to coordinate the benchmarking group as well as today's webinar. Um, so, again, my name is Mike Kraft, and I'm here with my co-lead, Lori Martinez. Um, what I thought I could do initially is sort of talk to you about how we, we approach this issue from a working group perspective. So, you know, when we thought about this issue, what our working group really sort of settled on was that, you know, civility and respect in the workplace is fundamental to effective ethical cultures and organizations and also serves as a leading indicator for whether there may be larger issues of concern in companies and um, corporations. Uh, our benchmarking group was formed in February of last year um, to really focus on best practices around building respectful workplaces. Uh, there were uh, 16 participating organizations on the working group, and we solicited feedback from another 24 organizations through the Pulse surveys that we worked on with Casey and the ECI team that was used to help assist in our review. Um, we focused our attention really on outlining the areas of concern and the steps companies can take to prevent deterioration of civility and respect in the workplace. In particular, we thought it was important to really focus on some specific discrete points to help sort of facilitate and inform our review. And in particular, we focused on the concept of bullying behavior and harassment in the workplace. You know, the steps companies can take to prepare both managers and employees to deal with these issues effectively, and then ensuring that issues are appropriately addressed by corporations and organizations when they're identified. 
our report, which I believe you now have access to, was drafted based upon these group discussions and based upon the surveys and is organized into two specific sections, focusing again on the common issues related to civility in the workplace and the recommendations that we had as a benchmarking group regarding what companies can be doing to support a respectful workplace. And with that, if we can move on to the next slide, I'm, I'm gonna invite my co-lead, Lori, to share with us uh, the next couple points. Um, so so what, was, what was our process? Um, so we drafted from our group discussions and surveys um, obviously with no attribution to specific participating companies or organizations. Um, we leveraged different methods of information, which included conference calls, benchmarking, having conversations around the lessons learned. Um, and then obviously, as Mike just mentioned, the ECI member community and really making sure that we solicited that additional information um, to make sure that we were um, getting all the information we could and leveraging that broad experience. Um, as, as we talked about, the report is organized in a couple of different sections, which you'll see, um, and it includes both the common issues um, that Mike just mentioned and then also recommendations. Um, if we move into the next section, we can get into some of the meat. So what was it that we covered off in terms of common issues of concern? Um, and why are respectful workplaces so important? Um, so as Mike alluded to, this really is the foundation of effective organizational cultures. This is what we're built on. Um, this is what's so important to drive so many other aspects of the roles that we play from an ethics and compliance perspective. Um, I also think that our research, and, and I think based on our own experiences, we were able to see that um, this really has a direct impact on business performance. I know there have been several studies that have put out that talk about this specifically. Um, and we know that businesses with a higher level of disrespect um, are more likely to suffer losses from an employee productivity, morale, um, attrition, all of these areas that ultimately hurt the bottom line. Um, and, and so really, despite the clear business incentives, it, we found out it was interesting that companies and organizations continue to struggle with this issue. Um, it's, there's no silver bullet to solve it. Um, I think in recent years, it's been given a lot more attention and I think we've seen a lot more focus. Um, but we still, be, we still hear and, and we are able to find in our research that 19% of Americans still have uh, suffered abusive conduct at work with another 19% having witnessed it. Similarly, you have three out of four individuals who've experienced harassment in the workplace, but never actually reported it. I think many of us know that sometimes these things, do they get lost in our respective bureaucracies and companies? Um, is there fear of retaliation? Um, there's so many reasons why this happens, but I think the numbers are alarming in that there's quite a bit of misconduct that's not being managed properly and not getting to the right channels so that we can ensure really as the front lines that this kind of disrespect and um, misconduct is not happening within our world. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so, so why is this so challenging? Um, you know, I think it's interesting for us to think about it. Um, you know, in some ways people, um, these experiences they perceive them in a way that might be different than our legal definition. So, you know, how do we define it? You know, what is it truly? Are we too worried about how we define it? How do we um, think about it if it's not tied to a protective category like gender or race or ethnicity? How does this get intermixed with areas around management style or management approach? And so, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the papers is how, in the paper is how do you identify it? In the absence of clear definitions, you know, how do we really differentiate that inappropriate behavior? Um, it's probably one of the grayest areas, I think, in this area, um, uh, in this body of work. And, you know, a lot of times there is that disconnect in terms of what employees understand versus um, what's you know, what's acceptable or not, you know, from their code of conduct. Um, let's jump to the next slide. 
Um, so one of the interesting things that we thought through as you think about these common issues is we all have this common thread around speaking up cultures. And I know in the industry, we talk a lot about having a speaking up culture, um, but I still believe that um, through the discussions and survey results, um, we're still seeing the telltale signs that, you know, people, we don't have consistency across our various industries and companies of having really robust speaking up cultures. Um, we're still seeing a pretty significant lack of trust in management. Um, I would say inadequate or maybe even inconsistent tone at the top. Um, and we're seeing, you know, there are in some places absence of even fundamental non-retaliation and speak up policies, or you may have a policy that's more of a paper policy, but not necessarily um, put into action or not enforced as consistently as I think would make employees feel more comfortable. Um, so, so where does this come from? One of the things that we talked a lot about was really this lack of effective communication or training, um, both for employees in terms of how to, raise his issue, how to raise issues and get comfortable raising issues, but maybe even more importantly, how do managers react and respond to those concerns? What are their obligations? How do they respond? What does non-retaliation actually mean? Um, and so we spent some time really kind of digging into that, that issue set and thinking through what some of those solutions might be. Um, and then the last thing was really that failure to follow up with complainants in a timely manner when concerns are raised. And I would also say, you know, also talking about, um, you know, how do you have that delicate conversation around confidentiality as investigators um, or as compliance professionals or HR professionals, we can't always share fully what the outcomes are of some of these investigations. And sometimes that leaves those who feel like they've really got on, gone out on a limb to report an issue or raise a concern, they feel like it's unclear what the actual outcome was and whether or not their courage to raise that concern actually made a difference in their culture. And so thinking through those ways to really make sure that we're closing that loop with the complainant, but also making sure that we're communicating what we can when we can. Uh, next slide. And I think with this, I will pass this on to Mike. Thanks, Lori. So, you know, with the challenges that Lori has sort of walked through in mind, uh, you know, the benchmarking group sort of worked together to try and identify several recommendations that we thought could help support a more respectful workplace in organizations and companies. And I, I think what you will see both in the report and in our discussion today is that unsurprisingly, these are some of the same recommendations that we routinely discuss across the industry regarding how to um, ensure effective ethics and compliance programs writ large. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, starting with a strong code of conduct and policy governance. When we did our pulse surveys on this issue, you know, what we saw, you know, in a significant majority was that um, most companies address bullying through either their code of conduct or corporate policy. But what we also thought was very interesting was the fact that three quarters of those respondents also stated that they didn't really differentiate bullying from any other form of illegal harassment. And what we talked about as a group was the, the potential consequence of that sort of absence of differentiation was that it can, it can mask the sort of forms and severity of the bullying conduct that could be occurring that isn't based on some sort of explicit protected category like race or ethnicity, um, as well as sort of hiding the pervasiveness of the conduct in the workplace. So one of the things that we talked about as a benchmarking group was this concept of um, companies actually more explicitly defining what bullying is in their codes of conduct, in their corporate policies, uh, so that it is clearly understood from an employee perspective and a manager perspective you know, what the scope of behaviors are that are prohibited in an organization, um, and in so doing, to then be able to be better trained on those requirements, on those expectations, so that we, for lack of a better phrase, kind of demystify what is or is not appropriate in the workplace. 
And with that, if we could turn to the next slide. Great, thanks, Mike. So as Mike alluded to, we did talk a bit about training um, and training for managers and, and employees. And I think this is really important because it, at least what I can say from my experience is oftentimes managers, it's not just you know, training on what are the legal requirements. Um, while it is important to make sure that employees know that fundamental information, and I think that is critical, there's also this piece about ensuring that people are, that managers are equipped to handle the situations. And by that we mean, sometimes these can be really nuanced conversations. We talked about this difficulty in defining sometimes what the it is. Um, we talk about sometimes these are really uncomfortable conversations. And so with that, it, it really is more than just training a manager on the topics themselves. And a lot of times it really is about how do we help them understand something as simple as when an employee walks into your office or you know grabs you for a five minute conversation if you don't have time to thoroughly listen deeply and hear the concern the employee has to raise it's okay to say what you're telling me is really important i want to give it my full attention um, let's set up time in the next day to ensure that um, I, I can really sit and listen and hear the feedback that you want to share. Um, often, rather than trying to rush through a hallway conversation that feels awkward for everyone, or because you're so busy blowing the employee off and, and not making time to have that conversation. These are sometimes really simple tricks that make all the difference in how comfortable an employee feels in raising the questions. And so um, it's not just having training, but really having that effective training that allows time for role plays and really goes through the nuances of navigating these kinds of tough situations. Um, you know, I think similarly, it's, it's hard to know what inappropriate behavior actually is. Um, sometimes, you know, employees feel like, well, you know, they meant it as a joke or I'm not quite sure it's a problem. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know whether it actually is or they feel like they have to gather a lot of information before they come forward. And so I think, again, part of that training of employees on what it is and how to identify it is also just about, you know, if you see it, say it, um, you know, come forward. We'll help you figure out whether or not this is an issue to be addressed. Don't feel that obligation. Um, and I also think helping them understand kind of lifting the hood on what the process is so that where they have concerns around confidentiality or fear of retaliation or if they feel they want to raise the issue anonymously, you know, it, it's, it's not always easy to fully investigate when something is fully anonymous. And so you know, I think that's a place to start, but it's also a great place to continue to build that rapport with that reporter or with that employee so that they get more comfortable um, in raising those concerns. And I think providing some transparency in how the process works, even before an employee is in that situation, I think helps create that context with when, when they need to raise that situation, they feel a little bit more comfortable about it. And um, I also think that, you know, when we're thinking about resolving interpersonal conflicts, how do you empower employees to work together? So there are times that, you know, I know in my experience, it's less about running an investigation and it becomes more about how do you help a, a peers or maybe how do you help a team understand each other's perspectives? or different styles of working or different styles of communicating. And this is where I found it very valuable to partner with my HR business partners or my fellow compliance officers, where we can actually have a conversation that might be actually more about teaming and how do you think through a more fearless teaming approach so that the teams have better overall communication. So that way when these types of conflicts or issues come up, Again, you, you have that groundwork of trust and that, that, the, that foundation that allows you to have some of these more difficult conversations. So, I, you know, I guess at the end of this, it was really, yes, there's the room for formal training, but also I would encourage everybody to think a little more innovative and innovatively about 
how this can extend to even role playing, coaching, and just day to day advice that might come from a number of different forums. I'll pass that back to you, Mike. Sure. So now that we've, in theory, trained our, our, our managers and our employees in terms of how to spot these issues, how to try and, you know, um, amicably resolve problems amongst themselves, inevitably there are going to be situations where issues are of such a concern they need to be escalated to human resources or compliance and ethics for some form of a formal investigation. So the other thing that we talked about as a benchmarking group is, you know, the critical need that companies and organizations have for having formal mechanisms and a formal process that they follow to handle these types of complaints when they arise. And, um, you know, first and foremost in our minds as a group was this concept of organizations acting quickly when an, an, an issue is raised through presumably some sort of formal mechanism, whether it's employee helpline or some third party tool where employees, managers, or other individuals in the workplace can raise issues in a manner that's confidential and hopefully anonymous as requested to escalate these issues. Once received though, companies need again to have a sort of formal process that they have that, that clearly defines the roles, responsibilities, the record keeping requirements that are going to be followed to sort of facilitate that prompt investigation of the allegations that have been raised. Um, part of that necessitates you know, the, you know, whether it's a, an investigation conducted by an HR team or some sort of standalone compliance ethics function, that whatever group that is that's doing that investigation is first and foremost engaging with the complainant in a timely manner, um, ensuring that they're conducting the investigations in an objective manner, and that ideally those investigations will be conducted confidentially to the extent possible. Um, to address the natural fears of retaliation and reprisal that, you know, complainants routinely have in these situations, even in, even in organizations that do the best job they can do from a training perspective. Um, on top of that, what we discussed and what we agreed on in a group was this, the concept of when allegations are substantiated, that the discipline is issued in a timely manner and that the discipline is consistent across an organization regardless of the role or level of the individual or individuals in question. The final thing that we talked about as a group is this concept that I think has gotten a lot of attention over the last few years related to companies sort of affirmatively following up with the complainant on some periodic basis after the conclusion of an investigation to inquire with that individual and to sort of assess whether or not they've been subjected to any sort of retaliation or reprisal due to the investigation's conclusion. And, you know, I think what we talked about as a group was that that looked to be, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a, a sort of an emerging best practice for organizations to be focused on to help sort of address the, on, sort of the ongoing fear and, um, anxiety that complainants can uh, experience when they're raising these sorts of issues and thereby hopefully sort of demystify and address those concerns on a going forward basis. And then the final point related to that we talked about as a group was other sort of monitoring activities that companies can do independently of reaching out to a complainant for that same purpose. So as an example, you know, through the normal performance management cycle is the HR team, is the compliance and ethics team, is the legal team looking at, you know, the performance management process as it might pertain to a specific complainant to validate kind of independently and objectively, is there any sort of repercussion evidence through that performance management process that might be indicative of potential retaliation in response to the issue that's been raised. Um, but fundamentally what we saw is having that formal process, having those formal mechanisms in place, um, ultimately go to support and reinforce this concept of a respectful workplace um, for companies and organizations. Uh, next slide, and Lori, turn back to you. Great. Um, so I, this is in conclusion, um, as we think about the report and reflect on it holistically, you know, as we mentioned, we really believe, and I, and I think we saw consistently through our benchmarking group that Respectful workplaces really are the foundation um, to that effective organizational culture 
Um, and I, I think that if this is fundamental to the success and effectiveness of ethics and compliance programs, I think, um, you know, in many ways, we are the front lines um, to ensuring that there is organizational justice and fairness and consistency in our processes. And that ultimately, you know, we're partnering with managers and leaders on the importance of this topic to ensure that it's it's managed and um, and that there's appropriate education and understanding of the both the risk that comes about when you don't have that um, and the the broader impact of that health. I think you know one of the things we talked about was this sort of prevalence of disrespect and uncivil con on conduct in the workplace can be a canary in the coal mine for companies in terms of figuring out whether or not there are broader issues, um, more maybe even more significant issues as we think of our other ethics and compliance risks. Um, a lot of times these are just the tip of the iceberg and can be very informative in terms of the broader cultures that we see in the organizations and the other issues um, which could have broader implications. And so we really feel that if organizations really see this behavior with regularity, um, that it's something that they should be working through and better understanding and can have a really positive impact on their culture if they think about it and work through it positively, um, but can also be quite detrimental if it's something that they deprioritize or, or don't focus on in an appropriate way. Um, and we, we went through the slides, but now we have some time. I think next, um, Casey's actually going to facilitate us through a Q&A so that um, we can get out of the slides and get into some open discussion. So with that, Casey, I'll pass it to you. Great, thank you. So we have our first question. Um, do you have suggested code language that defines bullying? So that's a great question. Um, you know, it, it was something we talked a lot about as a group, and, what, and and one of the challenges that we saw in this instance was there really isn't a common definition of what constitutes bullying. Um, although we did look to you know other resources to sort of inform our consideration, uh, like the Workplace Bullying Institute. Um, you know, how companies want to define it, I think, is. In, in part going to be driven by how willing companies are to uh, really um, effectively differentiate it from other forms of illegal harassment based upon protected categories. But what we sort of talked about and what you'll see reflected in the working group paper is this concept of it, of it being abusive conduct that's threatening, humiliating, intimidating, um, that interferes with work, that you know constitutes verbal abuse. Those are sort of the, the, the hallmark signs that we talked about as a group. Um, but that's a long and short way of saying, ultimately, it was, it, it's difficult to arrive at a single um, clear definition because there isn't one necessarily agreed upon in the industry. Lori, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I mean, what I would add to that is that, you know, a lot of times, and I would just say I apply this to all gray areas, you know, there, there's the legal requirements in various countries, but I also think it's important to look to your values and where you as a company want to draw the line in terms of what's appropriate or inappropriate behavior for your company. Um, I think that it, it makes a very big difference in terms of what type of culture and what type of tone you're trying to set. And I would take a look at that definition because it is sometimes in that gray area and really make a determination based on who's the, what is the culture you want to have, who, who are the people that you want to have in your organization, and, and really set those lines and define that code of conduct language as that North Star in terms of where you want to draw those lines and truly what your expectations are. Um, again, because there's not a specific definition that is consistent, I, I truly think this is an opportunity for companies to really take stock, think through their values and determine who they want to be as an organization in, in terms of what's appropriate versus not in this space. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Do you endorse managers investigating allegations of bullying? If so, do you suggest managers report those investigations for data analytics? 
I mean, I can start. Oh, go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to let you go ahead first, Lori. Go, you know, please take the lead. Sure. So I, I, in my experience, I don't typically have managers investigating. I think for me, it's important to have a fair and consistent process and ensure that everybody has the opportunity um, to share their perspectives in, in an objective way that's free from potential retaliation. I also think from a manager point of view, because they have to be their day-to-day -day manager, I think it can create some additional risk from retaliation if they're trying to do both at the same time. Um, having said that, I think that's where it's important to distinct, distinguish what's truly bullying behavior. If, if an ER or a compliance and ethics investigator looks at it, and it really is more about peer conflict or um, you know, a, a specific issue or problem that needs to be solved, I think it's completely acceptable to facilitate those conversations and let them be sorted separately by the management team and the employees. But I think in those cases, you want to be really clear that that's why it's being handed back to a manager. Um, I, I typically wouldn't do it for those other reasons. Yeah, and to jump in on that, I completely agree with with Lori's comments. And you, you know, I, I I draw the distinction between what is what is quote unquote the investigation, and what is the manager doing sort of the the basic due diligence and active listening to hear from the employee about what they experience, so that they can sort of do an initial assessment of is this something I need to escalate to employee relations to compliance and ethics to address, or is this just indicative of the sort of um, interpersonal um, communication that I think, you know, Lori has sort of alluded to with her comments. Um, and again, I think it's indicative of what, and I love the phrase that Lori used earlier about the sort of delicate conversation. You know, again, I think, I think companies and organizations need to empower their managers enough where they, they know how to spot these issues, how to handle these issues as an initial matter. But again, also understanding what's that point in time where the, the manager needs to recognize, you know what, what's very clear now is this is not something that I should be independently handling. This is something I should be escalating to some corporate function to ensure that there is a independent, objective, consistent um, investigation truly conducted um, rather than me sort of doing it on my own. Great. Uh, so next question, what would you include in a standard ethics training, and then what would be a part of an advanced training? So I'll jump in first and then invite Lori to, 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 to share her insights as well. So, you know, I, so part of this is, is also informed by, you know, what's, what's the training and communication um, um, options that a company or organization wants to consider because there's not a one-size-fits-all. And certainly what I've seen in, in my area at, at the company I've been is sometimes we say training a lot, but really what we are really fundamentally talking about is simply communicating basic expectations. But with all that being said, you know, I, I think the standard stuff, you, you know, needs to be the basics, you know, what are, what's the values of the organization? What are the expectations of employees and managers under a company's or an organization's code of conduct? Um, you know, how can employees raise concerns if they, if they run into an issue? Um, what's the process that um, the company is going to follow to assess those concerns? And what can they expect to happen thereafter are sort of the, the basics. And then from a quote-unquote advanced training perspective, you know, I think that's where you really have the opportunity to do, you know, the, the, the role-based, the discussion-based training that I think Lori talked to earlier in our presentation, where you really sort of talk through with employees, you know, scenarios and issues so they learn how to assess and how to issue spot by essentially practicing that process with you uh, in the training itself. Lori, thoughts? Yeah, so maybe I'll take it. I agree with with what you've just said, and I, I think my approach would be similar. Um, on top of that, I, I try to think about what's the expect, what are the expectations and role of managers at different levels? 
So um, one other thing that I typically do is a senior leaders training versus a first line supervisor training on these topics. And, and the reason I differentiate some of that is from a senior leader's perspective, sometimes some of these issues around fear of retaliation or confidentiality or people just not feeling comfortable about having these conversations, um, it, it, some of that stems from what they believe would happen when these types of issues get to a senior leader. Is this going to block my career? Is this going to impact my ability to move from this organization to that organization? And so one of the things that I try to convey to senior leaders is just how important that tone at the top and how and, and what that looks like for them. What does it mean? Does it mean you know, that they send out the invite to the training? Does it mean that when they're just in their day-to-day -day talk track, talking about the importance of raising concerns, the importance of, you know, a non-retaliation policy, and, and really trying to work with senior leaders to more naturally pull some of these topics into their talk tracks and into the way that they run their organizations. Um, I, I think that becomes really important because I think a lot of times senior leaders, they want to support and they want to engage. They just don't always have the words to do so. And so a lot of times my conversations with them are really about that nuanced um, situation. And likewise, when their leaders or managers come to them and say, oh my gosh, I've had so many issues in topic X, you know, what do I do about it? Um, and a lot of times how that leader responds and reacts is really critical to how that first or second line manager reacts. And so I also speak to them very clearly about ensuring that they're supporting the investigation. They're talking about not interfering with that investigation. They're talking about the importance of making sure there's fairness um, and that if people come to them afraid for retaliation, that they're giving those assurances. Um, and, and lastly, I'd say that, you know, if there truly is misconduct, I always talk about in those leadership meetings that if it escalates to you, I don't want to terminate my star, you know, engineer or salesperson or HR leader, you know, that that senior leader understands the importance of saying, no, we need to hold people accountable. Because I do think that it's through that accountability that you start to tamp down some of that fear retaliation. It won't ever be gone. I don't think ever any organization that'll go away. I think it's a little bit of human nature. Um, but I do think that there are ways that senior leaders can hold leaders accountable and reinforce messaging in a way that truly supports that broader cultural shift and engagement you're trying to set. So, so that's what I really focus on in that senior leader training. And then um, likewise to, to Mike, I, um, I also, the first line manager is just making sure they understand the basics of how to spot it and report. And a, a, one other tip I'll just add is, um, you know, if managers or leaders have never been deposed before or have never been on the hot seat themselves to explain why they said something in a particular email or why they've made, taken a particular position, um, I, I've done this both in a mayor, you know, we might even have an outside lawyer come in and, you know, you do a mock deposition or in Europe, we do mock hearings, disciplinary hearings um, in appeal reviews so that managers can truly see what it means to explain their actions um, more fully. So just a, a couple of other tactical things to think about. Great. Uh, the next question is, how would you approach an employee who is clearly afraid of retaliation? Um, so I can start that one and Mike, uh, welcome to jump in. So we'll do this in tandem. Um, so, so I think for me, I get it. Sometimes no matter what assurances you give, um, they, people are really afraid. And so sometimes what I'll do is really start from maybe a more specific place of confidentiality. And as that trust gets build, built, um, you know, expand my investigation. Sometimes it's not realistic to do that. But if I can, I try to tactically do that. Um, I, I also want to make sure I'm taking the time to suss out the situation and really understand if there is a true 
fear. Maybe this is a culture where, you know, the leader is more volatile, or maybe they tend to single out employees in a way, or they've got a reputation. And so in those cases, what I try to do is actually create some scaffolding around the investigation in terms of, you know, I may go do some extra research with a business partner to get a sense of, hey, what's the culture of this group or this leader? Um, I may talk to a more senior leader in the organization to get a sense of, you know, the culture and the history there. Um, and just you do a little bit of um, homework, I would say, um, you know, not predisposing that a manager is going to be retaliatory and not necessarily disclosing that there is a specific investigation, but just more of a seeking to understand the context. Um, and then, and then I, it, it helps me understand, you know, whether or not I need to be extra vigilant about whether or not there is some retaliation and how, you know, strongly am I giving assurances and maybe even throughout the process, do we need to hold people accountable for retaliation if they start to treat even the reporter differently during an investigation? So it just, it creates, um, a little different vigilance. Now, if they're just afraid because this is the first time they've raised it, I might handle it a little differently and, you know, again, try to be as transparent as I can about the process. Um, I try not um, to have people, I know we have the anonymous tools, but I, I do try to tell them we can do the best investigation if we have the best information. And so while those tools are available and they can always use them, I can be more effective if we can have a conversation. Um, but sometimes these employees ultimately decide that they're going to go through those channels instead of working direct. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with Lori's comments. Uh, the only bit I would add is, you know, in terms of the sort of direct interpersonal interaction with, with um, the complainant or the employee in that situation, the other thing I simply add is, you know, at the end of the day, although the unfortunate reality is sometimes these sorts of investigations can have the feel of an adversarial process, excuse me, process, they don't have to feel that way. So just in terms of how you talk to the complainant, how you engage with them, how you speak to them can go a long way, at least in my experience, to helping them be more at ease dealing with you at the issue, on the issue which can also help to address that underlying fear of retaliation with the acknowledgement that the, the practical reality is, you know, I think this will always be an underlying concern that we in our industry are going to have to deal with. And it's not something that we're ever going to be completely able to, to do away with. It's just a practical reality of inherent in the sorts of issues that we have to deal with sometimes. Casey. Great. So I'm going to ask this next question in two parts. Um, so the first is, how do you define workplace? So I'll start. Um, so we define workplace to mean not merely um, the four walls of our building, uh, but also, and I'm speaking, you know, wearing my my professional hat as a representative of my company. You know, it's, the, it's not merely the four walls of our, our building or our offices, but it's also any time an employee or a group of employees would be participating in any other work-related events, either on-site or off-site, from our facilities. Yeah, and I would add to that, you know, even if it's the happy hour that's attached to the event, um, I, I've seen it defined where, you know, if two or more employees are present, then it's considered a work event um, and issues should be raised in that context. I think this is a gray area where, again, each company really needs to determine how they want to navigate the situation. I think the key thing for me is whatever it is, make sure it's clearly defined in your policies and your trainings. And I would also ensure that managers understand their their responsibilities in those um, situations outside of the office, as in happy hours or um, conference events or, or those type business trips, those kinds of external places so that they understand that there, there is, if they see somebody being harassed at the happy hour afterwards, 
um, and multiple employees and a senior leader witnesses that, that we expect that will be raised um, and it will be dealt with. Um, again, I think this is where you have to think about your country nuances um as well um but i think as a company it's really important to define this clearly and then make sure those expectations are set and that managers are equipped for dealing with those situations um, if they find themselves in the middle of them the other point i would add is i i think the practical reality is um there are certain roles and levels in the organization where um, however inconvenient it might be, I think that people in those positions have to recognize that um, it is impossible for them to completely shed their professional role or title in any instance. And I'm thinking about people at the sort of C-suite level where, you know, they're, they, whether or not it occurred at a work event or off, not at a work event, um, inevitably they are, uh, they are linked to the company um, by virtue of their role and title, and they need to recognize and, and accept the fact that if, if they behave in a manner that's inappropriate, that that necessarily can be something that can be in scope for the company to look at from a disciplinary perspective. Thank you. Uh, and then the second part, uh, do you address behaviors outside of the workplace, such as on business trips, and if so, do you include this in training? Uh, I do currently. Yeah, it, it, both the definition and scenarios within the training. Uh, same on my side as well. I, it's, again, as Lori sort of touched on, you know, this is a gray area. I think, um, you know, as we continue to sort of blur the lines between the personal and professional interactions that we might have, it becomes more so, which is why it's so critically important we do define it and that we do address it through our training um, and in our policies and procedures, so we so it is clear to employees what those expectations are. Yeah, and we do extend it to if somebody's sending inappropriate messages to another employee via things like Instagram um, or WhatsApp. I mean, we've certainly looked into those. It might it might be on a personal phone, but if there's a manager that's sending you know inappropriate pictures or content, I mean, we would address that even if it's not on a. It makes it harder maybe for us to pull the data, obviously. Um, but if a reporter provides that information to us, we certainly would look into it, even if it was on a per personal phone, as an example, or within a personal app that's not related. I mean, again, this gets into some gray area stickiness and you have to navigate carefully, but I mean, it's a manager and an employee, you know, regardless of what platform it came from, it's gonna come back into the workplace. All right, I have uh, two more questions. Uh, what type of training or engagements have you implemented? Um, I think we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I would just say that, you know, I think having a consistent curriculum is really important. And, it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, making sure, and Mike talked about as well, everything from the fundamentals for your first line managers in terms of what needs to you know what what are the definitions for those areas that we have definitions if there aren't legal requirements how have we as a company defined what the um topics are where the lines are i think it's important to make sure that managers are equipped to identify red flags and know how to react and respond when people raise those issues um, also covering for those first line managers the channels for reporting and making sure that they know where to go um, and then I guess I, and then as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, really that senior leader training and really thinking through what it means to, um, you know, to be a senior leader and set the appropriate tone. Um, one other thing I would add is depending on the audience, um, I've also in a couple of instances, especially where we're doing intact teams with a specific group of leaders or managers, we might actually say, share some of our statistics, you know, obviously, you know, in large groups, not uh, in large anonymized data sets, not in, you know, there were three people in group X kind of uh, 
disclosures, but you know, we have X number of investigations across the company in ABC categories, and we have you know, Y percentage of substantiation and, um, you know, et cetera. You know, these are some of the process areas we focused on. Um, I, I have done that in a number of different companies. And, um, and in one company, we even published them on a quarterly basis out to the entire organization um, in an anonymized way. And that's also another way to, to educate and inform through training. Um, and so, that sometimes it makes um, the employment lawyers a little squeamish, um, but it is something if, again, it aligns with your culture and the type of transparency that you have in your culture, it might make sense to consider. And it's something that you can dabble in releasing, you know, small bits of information to smaller groups. And, you know, as the organization gets more comfortable with it, share more broadly over time. Mike, the other thing that I've seen and that we've certainly done in, in, in my in some of the companies I've been at is, you know, to the extent that an organization is doing, you know, routine, you know, culture, ethics culture survey activity is, you know, talking about the results of, of the survey responses uh, as part of that and using that to help sort of as a discussion tool for the um, larger steps that the company might be taking to address you know, workplace misconduct or to educate people on how to escalate issues, you know, all of those just sort of different pieces of information offer up uh, potential other tools that you can use to educate, to communicate, to um, um, illustrate to employees um, what their resources are that are available to them, what their obligations are, those sorts of things uh, that they can be leveraging. Great, and then the last question is, um, do you have any suggestions on how to address this topic with senior leadership to get more focus and visibility? So I'll start and then invite Larry to chime in. So, I, you know, I think Lori's touched on a lot of that, right, is, you know, speaking to them and, and training them on their obligations as senior leaders in the organization. Um, you know, I think part of that is, you know, in a perfect world from an organization, organizational perspective, having a having your whether it's your HR or your ER leader, or your compliance and ethics leader, be in a perfect world being viewed as a peer of those individuals, so that they can be communicating to them about the importance of these issues, and opening the door for your employee relations and your ethics and investigation functions to engage with them, whether it's individually or as a group to sort of talk to them and train them about these various issues. Um, and then using that relationship, I think, to hopefully be invited in to do deeper training within their management team and then their organizations on these sorts of issues. Lori, thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, no, I agree with your perspective. And as I mentioned earlier, that was one of the, the ways that I engage is through the training. Um, but I also think some of it is about resourcing, right? Even understanding that you know, what, what is that role of the employee relations team or the compliance and ethics investigations team versus, you know, their HR business partners or their, their business lawyers. Um, and the nuance of having these conversations and setting that tone. I think sometimes, you know, we're all just sort of a big blob of GNA functions <laughs> to some, to some of the leaders. And so I think it's important to understand that this is, you know, that they've got a team of experts that are available to them. And just like they turn to their sales leaders or their marketing leaders, you know, or their business lawyers for, you know, specific outcomes, this is, you know, similarly important um, in this dialogue and that to truly have the culture that they want to have and all the benefits that come with having those healthy cultures, um, you know, they have a role to play. And I think just continuing to reinforce that and build those relationships and making sure you have that seat at the table is just really critical um, to all of this hanging together. If you're just training the folks at the first line, but the leaders aren't on board, um, it's going to be very hard to have um, traction. It, it really takes, you know, kind of hitting it from both directions to, to really have the type of impact I think we as ethics and compliance and, and HR professionals want to have. Great. 
Well, thank you both, um, Mike and Lori, for uh, for being on this call, leading it, and also um, being co-chairs for the Respectful Workplace Working Group. I definitely appreciate your time. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, any of those who are on the call right now that were in the working group. Thank you all so much for your hard work on this report. I just wanted to take a few seconds to talk about the um, current working groups that I have going on that we are accepting members for. Um, I have the Trust and Transparency Group, ENC and Unconscious Bias, and then Compliance Auditing and Monitoring. These, uh, these working groups are open for members only, and uh, they are one call a month. They last for about eight to ten months, and essentially the end goal is to produce this action-oriented deliverable of best practices that will be shared with the ECI membership. And um, so if anyone is interested, my email is at the bottom. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. And um, we do, we always have new working groups ongoing. So if there is a topic that you are interested, um, that you're interested in, please let me know that as well. But um, in the next few minutes, I will be sending over the the working group paper, as well as an evaluation. It's just a few questions, and um, you know it'll help us with improving our future webinars. So um, again, thank you all so much um, to the working group, and thank you all for attending.